Christ in him. In Rio. In Australia. In Berlin. And? Click, click. Typing of keys. Answer. A smile. A wave of the hand. A look to the moon. He crossroads there, it seems. She aerials there, too. All love beams across the many wires. This is home, Ariel says. This is how we make the days go on, Prospero says. The second she, who is also Ariel, replies too, with a smile and a cup of coffee. The second she, who is also Ariel, also knew Prospero once. The second she types little words, furtive words, secrets from long ago, and then second she signs to the webcam in ASL. Waiting, the world waits. The world hopes. Change is. Is, I the first Ariel ask, what is is? How to obtain this is? Okay, look around. Today is Friday. The blue blink stare is beckoning. You can be anything. You can become, you can be. And in being give beauty. Awake, wonder, a sigh of relief. A challenge to bear. Click, click. And while the world holds, cup hands, forgiveness. Click, click. Time zones cross. The daily ritual of morning and waking, and morning and waking. How many today? All those children. Why? The news cries. No answers here, no matter how hard we try. And in Egypt and in Syria. Damascus prays. And, and we, we pray. pray. And click, click, fade. The beaming clock of time lets go its grip. And, and we, we are, are loose. Unto the wave of the cyber. And into kind of a space unnamed. I travel like she in 2046. The first she says, the one at the edge of the world. Floating past everything to find my love. Click, click, beam, blink. Status says, hold me. I didn't know you wanted to be, because you never asked. And if I were to... Sorry, I was away from my... That's okay. I was just... I see. I'm caught up now. You said... Never mind. No. Yes, I did say. By yes. Shall I yes? Ariel thinks the, the weight, weight of Ulysses, the, the sound of Molly Bloom haunting rapid darkness. Is it morning where he is? Adjust the clock. Check the time converter. I can't remember what time it is anymore. We travel at the speed of. Ah, uh, right. Yes. I do want to be home. says, and 
she means Ache, which is like luck or something stronger. Like a force to be reckoned with. Duende. Ache, but it is spelled A C H E. And A C H E also means ache. And I want both to be true in my life. My life. My life. Echo of song and memory. And then the picture of the cat scrolls upward, and another picture is revealed. Your face from last year, when I saw you last, and it was the last time I... <coughs> Echo of memory. The last because you were gone. You are past, and there is no more you. and signs on the scroll down, archived posts from last year, and I dare to look. Ariel looks. Ariel reads. Ariel scrolls. So Ariel is not Ariel from The Little Mermaid, but the other Ariel, who once lived on an enchanted island and now lives on an island in the here and now that is sometimes enchanted, but not in the same way because urban enchantments are not the same as those from so long ago. Your ellipses of thought across another millennium. If you, Prospero, were here today, I would say, we, we have, have messed, messed things up in a big way. We invest in apps when we should invest in love. Too simple for you? We invest in apps when we should go to the moon again and learn a little from that rock crater surface that guides us through the night crawl. In this night crawl, a blinking, pulsing, give me MSG because I ain't too. I want to start over. Forget the apps, no matter how fast and easy they make click click zing. Here we are, in time, across time, through time, blinking once, twice, piping and smiling and staring at the blue dot on Skype and praying for hands to. Because when you're gone, what is shrine altar bereft of you? Where is shrine altar without you? Today I stare at my coffee. And I am with him. In Berlin. Glasgow. Seoul. Rio. Buenos Aires. New York. Los Angeles. I can't help but feel the weight of the world again. Shudder to think. Shiver to believe. Reason to hope that you will answer from your own place of forgiveness, from your own silence, knowing what we have all been through. Cup hands over the cup. Warm. Ache. We wait, bartered on the trading floor of private companies whom we don't even know, whose faces we have never seen, because they don't blink. They're wired for a different kind of speed. And they lie in wait, watching us from a subterranean ocean floor, drowning in oil and refuse and bad juju, an ocean bought and sold in bits and pieces while we were looking. I was looking some, some other where for you. World, hand, cup, gesture of mercy. I remember the days when you were breath. Life. Love. When you were hope. Giving. Struggle. When you were war. Fled. Done. When you were trying. Ulta. Mine. Prospero asks, with a fugitive glance. When was I yours? Did I ever know this? Here, in space, in endless floating, I stare at you from behind the screen. Sleepless one of my imagining. Can you see me? 
the digital he now. No touch, just bodyless body. Signs and clicks, dots and zeros. But I can still see, feel something, <laughs> even without feeling. Oh, what this? Strange business? Are you still wearing that? Christ, take it off. You were not in that century anymore. What will people think? I know you never cared for that kind of, but you should because it's, sorry. Fingers won't, won't let me key in and touch. Fingers don't work anymore. Only signs, only MSGs from non-brain to, to once brain. Soul in mouth. Didn't you say that once? Your soul is in my mouth. Not found. It says you are not found. But I see you, know you're there. And the other one, too. Wake up, love. Is anyone listening? Prospero thinks. I will pretend to drink a beer. I will pretend that I am here. Prospero smiles. Big smile. Snoopy cartoon smile. I know I like comedians. The first aerial says, Blink. A blue sensor moves across the screen. The liquid planet accelerates. Today we begin again. Okay. <laughs> okay. Prospero looks at Ariel. He smiles. Something in him wants to. But he doesn't. Because it will frighten her. Right now. Ariel is looking at his altar. I am looking at his altar in the memory theater of this Facebook page. In the Twitter feed archive of your last days.
Retweet. Retweet. <laughs> Share. 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 We don't need touch here. We can float through the land of strings. Like Echo. Echo. Narcissus smiles through the water, a myth reborn. Shall I tell you a story? Children of the world, unite. Will you believe in all the crap we made of everything? No. Will you lay down your life anyway? Oh, say, will you upload your secret fantasy in this wondrous parade? still have 128 characters. I don't want to count anymore, she says. The second she agrees. The digital he has lost all sense of time. Counting is not what he's thinking about these days. Did anyone say anything about hot dogs? <laughs> <sighs> he remembers their smell. Junk food. Hot yeah. summers. Ballparks. Christ, it was beautiful, wasn't it? Yeah, I want that back. Play ball! Yeah. <laughs>
that she and second she and digital he have and once had in the live, in the live of liveness. This boy is desert. Caliban lives in the southern desert the southernmost tip in El Sur, La Sur, Del Sur. He aches too, but in a different way. He holds up his gadget and stares at the moon through the magnified virtual leg of Second She, who has been captured by digital means. If I stare long enough, boy says, I will go to the moon, or maybe Mars, or maybe some other planet that hasn't a name yet. Boy prays to know God, doesn't have church, doesn't have means. He is a still boy, strange, staring boy, stranded in the desert, looking southeast like out of a movie long ago, like out of hospital. Nobody knows where this boy's parents are or where he came from. Caliban is just there, staring, and in his mind imagining that her leg is attached to the moon itself like some surrealist painting. Caliban holds on to the moon's leg. In his mind, he is caressing it. There is no sex here, no sense of it at all, but something else. As if the boy saw a kind of god in Second Ariel's virtual leg. The boy signs, even though he doesn't know ASL. Take me there. A wish in the night. A wish to no one, like all of the other no ones out there in their wishful, blinking, keying, and tapping world. Blue against blue, screams of plenty. Caliban thinks, this phone is my light. It guides me. The boy doesn't have a phone. But he imagines if he could, if he really could, he could have this precious thing called an iPhone. And he could feel powerful. In Rio. In Damascus. In Galicia. In Rwanda. Thank you. 
naked as some god had made them. And touched the earth with his bare hands. And felt the burnished silver deliver mercy. The kind of mercy one dare not have in living life. Some said, but this boy felt it. And when he was not blind anymore, and stood in the desert staring at the moon with its leg of a woman, he knew that mercy belonged to him. Even if he stood on what some people call nothingness, in bare feet. He had but the right words to say. Thank you, and please. The floating city shimmers. The dancers in the celluloid dream are spent, as if they danced a marathon. She and second she and he are drunk on themselves. The strings of the city bend, just for them, it seems, and form a canopy. And soon their drunkenness infects everything, including the boy and El Sur Masur del Sur. Oh, what the hell? Who are we? How did we? Fuck this! Words spit out in half grunts and sleepy howls. The ache of all aches curves the inside of the screen. The hidden cameras of the world in all the data centers send signals to one another. Say, yes, yes we, we are, are drunk! drunk. Hooray! No, no work, work today! today. We say we do not know who we are. And we do not wish to be known. Across the strings of the floating city, suspended on a terrace of elegant leaves, a girl named Miranda stands counting the days that remain until she sees her brother again. Her brother is sick, in hospital. He is dying, they say. This is his second brain surgery. He aches too, and she as well. The girl looks as if she is from some other century. She wears the clothes her mother once wore. But the gadget, yes, in her palm, <laughs> gives her away. And 200 days. The echo echoes across the planet. The terrace leaves caress her skin. If she could, she would walk into the hospital right now and say, bring him back. Bring my brother back to me. In her house, in the house that she calls hers, but is her parents' house, the girl has set up an altar with some of her brother's things. These things are small and insignificant. Buttons, coins, Girl. These things are her brother. Somehow they are him, truly. Because seeing them there upon the little table she calls an altar makes her think of him and makes her want to pray, even though in her house, which is her parents' house, prayers are not well looked upon, because in her house, which is her parents' house, gods are not allowed, because someone told them that there were no gods anymore, not even here on this strange earth. Want to believe this because she thinks there must be two or three gods if so many things can happen in this world and on other planets and isn't it awfully arrogant after all to think we're the only ones ever she prays her little prayer for her brother bring him back bring him back to me in the hospital the brother hears his sister Miranda although she's speaking to him in a language she cannot understand this language is a kind of music, the music of rocks and stones and hurt things. In this music, the brother Ariel II, but to us as Ariel III, recalls his sister in her odd clothes and odd manner, and he laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> Boy. He only says so. And so far, everything.
everyone believes him. So why not? Everyday myths have been made of much more. In time, they will all know me. And it will be OK, because we are past centuries where boys who weren't really boys had to fear being found out. Aren't we? <laughs> the brother's laugh makes other people in the ward laugh. It makes others cry. Mothers dance. Mothers are more who they were once long ago. And they have this thing called memory. And they have this thing called memory. A woman in the hospital says, a woman who cannot remember says, I was a girl once. When I was a girl, I would wear a frown. And that frown would split the ocean in two. In my house, such frowns were frowned upon, but I didn't care because I wanted to be a surly girl. This was a long time ago. So long ago, I'm not sure the time ever existed. But people say I was there once, in a house, by the sea. And that I was a surly girl named Sycorax who did not make her mother proud. I often wonder who my mother was. Sometimes I imagine she is wearing red shoes and a red handbag. So I will say to myself, ah, oh, yes, mother, red shoes, red handbag. People make faces when I say that. I'm not sure why. It is exactly what I remember. At least I think I do. Maybe. Maybe I wasn't a girl at all. Maybe. Maybe I was a boy, and that wasn't my mother at all. What if I didn't have a mother? Today I will try to remember. Today I will be better. The woman who cannot remember stops mid-step. She places her hands on her hips. She does a little dance. She imagines a lover smiling at her from across the room, as if across a large dance floor. Roseland. Long, long ago. Like something out of an old record, with grooves, skips, and the scratchy sounds of humans. Roseland was a dance hall full of roses, she says. And the memory that she has invented, the memory that cannot be hers because she never went to Roseland except in dreams. The lover she imagines is not her lover, but rather a young man named Caliban, maybe 16. He is standing at the other end of the common room of the hospital with his head to one side. He has forgotten who he is. Accident. They say something about a car. Or maybe a hate crime. No one really knows. The young man named Caliban looks at the woman who cannot remember, named Sycorax, who is dreaming of Roseland, and he tries to dance. He does not know any of the moves, although he has seen them in pictures. But he dances anyway. The woman who cannot remember replies in kind. A sway of the hips, a shimmy and shake. For a moment, the beauty of the entire world moves between them.
In the waking world, her coffee brews. Ariel wrestles with the car keys. They are stuck in the pot. Damn it! She cries out to the heavens, as if the heavens would answer. Blink, blink. The screen pulses. Now, now, love, I can't. I'm But something in her wants to. OK, just this once. But that's it for today. How many times has she said that? The Facebook page is full. When was this? Where was? Wait, this was not real. This did not. Oh. Ariel drops the car keys. The young man wonders if he smells of fritters and tries to catch his reflection in the mirror of the common room. Glint of moon on his eyelids. His blue shoes are faded and torn and got a hole in them. Someone should take care of me, he says. What, what happened? happened? What, what happened, happened to me? me? Was it an accident? The woman who cannot remember holds him in her burning hands. She says, quiet, the world will save me. For a moment, as they dance this curious dance of love and misremembrance. The young man remembers something from his past. Maybe when he was seven or a little younger. Fragment and wisp blur of him running through the yard, filling his pockets with stones, emptying his insolence upon others. Stones thrown with rage at a figure across the street. Can't see the face, but the figure tries to run from the sting of the stones thrown by the young man when he was once a boy. Figure stops. Stones bleed in blasted memory. The young man sees the figure on the street, dying. The figure stoned by his stones, pummeled by his fury. The young man stops dancing. Moonbeam fritters blue shoes face. He hides his head in a corner of the common room. What have I done? The woman who cannot remember, the woman who calls herself yellow dressed sunflowers, leaves her arms in the air where the young man once stood, framed in longing. If this were Roseland, he would have kissed me by now, the woman says to no one. And she is right. Young man slides down the common room wall, 
Percy in the shock of memory. He curls his hands into fists and sinks them into his pockets hard. As if sinking into the ocean, deep buried stink. No mercy. <laughs> the woman who cannot remember lets out to laugh. Sweet like iced tea and summer days. She presses her pants with her hands and washes bits of the afternoon fade into scraps of sunlight. The woman who cannot remember looks out the window and wonders where she is and why she cannot recognize anyone and why that young man in blue shoes looks so sad, angry, and bolted to the earth. The common room hums with antiseptic silence. Occasional ring of bells down the hospital corridor. The boy who is the girl's brother, the boy who is not really a boy but makes everyone believe, spins a tale of yearning for a terrace with leaves where he once left his sister standing. Wicked he is for staying there! Miranda shouts against the blanket of the night. She is tearing at the leaves on the terrace and making herself a dress. Her hair and torso are already covered with leaves put together with glue and string. She has been working feverishly in the blistering breeze, unseen by her parents who have gone away to a friend's party. Before the end of night, Miranda has promised herself she will cover her entire body with leaves. And in this dress of browns, greens, and burnt amber, she will slip through the fabric of night and find her brother and bring him back home. The leaves stick to her skin. Her hands ache from trying to make the leaves do her bidding. She is thirsty. She eats the leaves. She drinks their poison with relish. Her thighs and legs and feet smell of rain and pollution. She scales the terrace like a superhero on a mission. She shouts. She steps through the air right like a tree and lets the wind carry her to her destiny. quite get between them and have him all to herself. She regrets that profoundly. She hates herself for it still, but she can't help it. He should have been mine. I was never good at sharing. Oh. 
cigarettes and wine, beer and charms, his hand on her knee and up her in front of everyone, daring the world. And she, the second Ariel. Who knew she was second and would never be the first, his one and only. Would say. Hey now, not here. But with a laugh in her throat, because she liked to dare too. Still does. And there was something gorgeous, mad, heavenly about his impromptu everything. Even if she resented the lack of stability and the way her order was disordered by his needs. Fuck up! Go away, please. We've done enough dancing. <laughs> No. Not now, love. I can't. Not anymore. Go back to your city of strings. What the hell? How did he? It was them the other night as they floated through the city. It was them drunk on everything after the imaginary ball game, the dancing. The celluloid dreams. How did you... <laughs> Fuck up. <laughs> and then she, as always, being the second she would do, say, back then and now. <laughs> Sur, ma sur, del sur. The desert was cold. Red earth, black with history. The boy Caliban stood against the light of the vanishing moon and swore that he'd return to those who belonged to him, even if he'd have to walk for hundreds of years through fields of blue petals and diamond earth hardened by labor. He held his hands up high toward the brilliant sky, a word caught in his throat, something like fire. He was forgetting words now, even the words of his own language, even the words he had made up once in order to get by in Rio, in Salta, in Greece, in, in. Consonants were escaping him. Vowels seemed like distant friends. He spoke in the language of nods, grunts, whispers, and gestures. And sometimes, stillness would overtake him. The same kind of stillness that people said made him strange. But in stillness, facing southeast, like that man out of that movie long, long ago, he could see everything the entire world. In it, he would see canyons, highways, and bridges of generosity. The vendor would give him sweets and ask for nothing in return. The woman would give him milk and hold him for an eternity. The girl at the other edge of the desert would send him spools of silver that ignited the underbelly of the sand songs of the ancients that lit his soul. Sometimes, in his travels, the boy stole things out of the corner of his eye when no one was looking. Objects that rested on altars, made by others. Little plastic toys, gum wrappers, sparkly things. He would carry them in his pockets for hours and use them to barter his way through the universe. In one city, a little plastic toy was for food and shelter for exactly the length of one hour. In another village, the sparky thing planted in shade from the burning sun before he went back on his bed. The boy was surprised at how he could 
writing. Wow. I will do that. I will try. Remember handwriting. Who is dear Sam again? Check Facebook. Scroll through posts yesterday. The day before, the day before yesterday. Scroll. Scroll. Eat. Vanishing text at my fingertips. Catch his eye. See? See, listen. Isn't it amazing? Oh, best ever. What is that? Nice. She nods at the seller in the store, rattling on about the new product and how good it is for everything. A miracle. The seller says. I don't think. No, sorry, don't believe it. Not even the ones in song sung true. The seller sours. He looks maybe 16. Must be odd job. Doing his bit while going to school. Doing his bit for the economy. 16 with hands in pockets, fists in when she says no. And she swears, maybe a stone, a rock? Is he pulling out a rock right here in the middle of the store, in the middle of faux luxury? But no, just hands, just gesture. Sorry, a large face didn't mean no miracles. Thanks. She is shame. That poor boy, what must he have thought? Seemed nice. Sweet, all of 16 probably, and already lost in the world of bits. Or maybe he's just come through. Maybe he's back in the world after a long voyage of some kind. Voyage of unreason. And this job, it's his way to get back into the swing of things. Hope I didn't ruin his day. Maybe I should buy that miracle thing. She starts to head back. Mid-step on the busy street. Push, shove, no words. Just push her. Everyone does. She suddenly feels quite old. The need to walk on the inside lane of the street very slowly. She's even forgotten why she stopped to. Oh, yes, the miracle. The other boy, the boy Ariel, the one in hospital, 
wants the sinking world to rise from the sea. He wants his sister to believe. He wants a memory of leaves. Oh my god! He takes her in his arms, and caresses her skin. Sister, brother, sing. Knowing all is lost, knowing it's okay, because something else will become night someday. Become night, become you. The brother sister Miranda forgets the terrace from which she came and only sees her brother now. They embrace for days, knowing there is no going back from this scrap memory. Torn in, held. The young man Caliban forgets the miracle as he stands in the store. He wants the safety of the common room again. He wants the anger of day's moonbeam printer's blue shoes. He knows all too well the sorry state of being born the first liar. Skin bristling to touch, shorn of passion, bullets bled inside the lining of his stomach. He dreams of home, though he knows he has never seen it, except in the fury of stones. The woman who cannot remember Sycorax sends him a sign across the city, through the walls of the hospital, through the land of roses, through a dance shared only once fleetingly, she says with a half smile. In this memory theater, we remember what we want. <laughs> <laughs> Prospero listens to the laughter as it echoes, like a spell, a charm held up to the sky. When I was here, he thinks, in the breathless impulse of desire, when I was yours, and for a moment, for a moment he is, your lips flush against mine mirror of time as we become the breath of stars. What? I thought you were. What? Nothing. No one. Okay. What are you? Nothing. Stop! I'm not doing anything. You're looking! Just thought. What? Thought maybe we'd met before? Party maybe? Got wrecked? No. My bad. <laughs> what? Still say that? What do you mean? Old phrase, my bad. Is it? Very. I'll still use it. Retro. But not intentionally. All right. Approve, do you? Maybe. Unintentional wins me points? Not play. Well, we'll figure of. Still not. Gold star, then? Life school. Why not? Silly. Well, maybe I am. Look, maybe we should drink. At this hour? Mid-afternoon, unwind. Look at the city. Let life go by. You do this all the time. How do you mean? This your line. I'm quite shy, actually. So you're... Absolutely. I'm impressed. <laughs> no, you're not. Don't believe me. I can see it in your eyes. Psychic. No. Don't even know me. Desert eyes. Me? 
like you've been, long time aching for peace. Poet man? Just what I see. Don't know anything. I was there too. Sorry? Damascus? Don't know what you mean. Pictures of the dead. I remember. Right. Well, but I should- One drink. What's it gonna hurt? Don't have time! I'm a good person. Shouldn't go around saying such what? things. What? Why not? He'll get beat. That's all right. I can take. Come on. You want to beat me? You have the wrong- I'm right here. I got no quarrel with the gods. You can do what you like. Listen, you seem sort of nice and everything, Am but- nice. <laughs> One drink. Okay. Nothing more. All right. We'll just- Look at the city. We'll drive. Would you like that? Your car? I. Everything. Shy, eh? <laughs> In my own way. All right. We'll ride. Remember a time when there were skips and grooves and rapturous mysteries inside the scratchy sounds. Here in the pitch of pitch, in palms open to the sky, in curled fists and your kiss, there's only us. Only you in the night.
expanded. Uh, we, um, rather than wait for the cast entirely, um, I thought maybe I could just get the conversation started, tell you just a little bit about where this play came from, how this play came to be, and, um, and then once the cast gets out here, we can uh, continue the conversation. Uh, my name is Neil Sharnick, I'm the director, and I'm also the director of the New Play Initiative here at Carthage. Uh, under the, the umbrella of that initiative, every year for the last eight years now, we've commissioned a new work by a, a prominent playwright, someone with a national or international reputation. Uh, and, uh, and this year, the playwright was Karadadzevich. The play is what you saw today. And uh, we're very excited about it. Um, I approached Karadad in part because uh, well, for one thing, I knew she was going to give us something we had not done before, we had never seen before. She was going to uh, give our students an opportunity to challenge their understanding of what theater is and what theater can be, um, as, as was the case here. Um, but also, uh, I appreciated that she's written several plays that are uh, rooted in riffing off of classical texts. She has several based on Greek tragedies, uh, one other that is uh, based on a Shakespeare play, her play Twelve Ophelias. And, uh, and we thought that would be a, a good fit for Carthage, for a liberal arts college to tap into and connect with what's happening in the heritage program. Uh, so we're very excited about that. And um, what we got was uh, uh, exciting, but certainly challenging. Uh, the, the text on the page, you may be curious when you see all this, what the script looks like that, that generates this. Uh, the text on the page um, is, uh, is unconventional in terms of, of dramatic literature. There's never an indication in the script, or almost never, uh, of who's speaking, or, um, or how many actors are on stage. Or, uh, and, uh, so a lot of the text can be interpreted um, there are there are clues, there are things in there, but uh, can be interpreted in any of a number of ways. So if this play gets picked up and another production happens, uh, you can be certain that it will look a lot different from what you saw here today. All right, we have some casts coming out. So now that there are some casts to field questions, uh, does anyone want to get the ball started? Get, get the ball rolling. Yes, back there. Sure. Uh, the question is, uh, did being in this play, did these students change for any of them their opinion of social media, their attitude toward it? Sure. Definitely. I think it was eye-opening. There's a scene specifically where Ariel's laying in bed and she's, and she's whatever, doing Pinterest or whatever she's doing before she goes to bed, and then it almost shows her waking up and doing the same thing, and I'm thinking, like, we don't do that. I don't do that. And then I'm like, I do that. I definitely <laughs> do that. <laughs> I don't know, that was really eye-opening for me, to go to bed to technology, to wake up to technology. <coughs> Definitely. Yeah. Others? Yeah, kind of in a more positive way. I think I've always thought of social media as like, oh, like my mom and I had this conversation. She's like, you all text each other and you're on Facebook. You don't like look in each other's eyes and have a real conversation. And I was like, but we do, mom, you know? And like, it's not as good, but like this has made me realize that like, Social media, like it is human interaction. It's it's not as strong and as personal, and it's it's kind of like a substitute, but it is powerful. And there is like, you know, she's able to like connect with Prospero even though he's gone. So it's like, it's still a good thing. It's still a, a gift, and we don't want to like get trapped in it. Uh, yeah. Good. Another question. Yeah. Yeah, um, the question was, to what it, did the Tempest influence our process? Or to what it, if so, to what extent? Uh, what was our interaction throughout with the Tempest? Um, I would say that our process, my sense, is that it did not have 
a whole lot to do with the Tempest. The, the Tempest was an important lens for trying to come to some understanding of what we had here, right? Trying to say, okay, so who is Prospero in the Tempest, and what does that mean to us, right? How does that translate into this world? What is his relationship with Ariel? What is the relationship with Caliban? Who is he? And what does that then mean in this play? If that was the starting point for the playwright, we need to, needed to get our heads around who those characters were. Uh, but to what extent that really then informed the work we did, I'd say that was relatively small beyond that initial task. Would anyone have more to say? I'm actually reading The Tempest right now for the first time. Um, um. <laughs> I feel bad saying it. But um, there's a lot of there's a lot of parallels in almost things that characters will say, like I was reading that Prospero said something about my something about soul and mouth, not exact words, but speaking my soul, and um, that's one of Prospero's lines, and even um, when he's like, what's this strange business? He says that completely in The Tempest, and I was blown away, like, Caridad made no mistakes. All, everything she does is like, she, with yeah. purpose. But I love that in this play about memory and and its failures in some ways, uh, that he'll say, didn't you say that your soul is in my mouth? And he's misquoting himself. <laughs> but he's, he's misremembering. But it was him who said it, and it wasn't quite that. But, but yeah, when you do spend time in the text, you start to realize, oh, there's actually a lot related. Uh, it's the way I, I kind of feel about it, because there are lots of, and, and to go into the shared themes and stuff, we could go on about, like there's a lot of a lot of shared themes between the two pieces. But um, kind of like if you had, if you were to have read The Tempest for, for several days on end, over and over again, and then gone to bed and had a dream, <laughs> the dream is kind of what this production is, you know? <laughs> that's, that's kind of how I think about it. Because it's, like, it's, it's related, and the names are there, and, the, and the, some of the relationships are there, but it's not really the same story. It's not really, yeah. Yeah, yeah Connor. I'd say it actually really influenced me a lot during Tech Week. Uh, oddly enough, I started thinking a lot more about Relationship, relationship between Sycorax and the Calibans, or the Sycoraxes and the Calibans, and the line that sticks out to me the most is, woman who cannot remember. Uh, and it really made me think, if Sycorax is the absence of memory, and in the Tempest, Sycorax pushes Caliban to do this bad thing, um, I mean, it really enlightened me as to the relationship I had with Ariel 3, which kind of becomes the, the bad thing that Caliban does, the hate crime um, moment take it what you will, but it really, I mean, if, if Sycorax is the absence of memory, then absence of memory is pushing this character, Caliban, through his path, and it, it's pushing him to hurt people, but also, at the end, he finds safety and love in this embrace of absence of memory, um, and just the symbolism behind the, the figures who aren't even characters is uncannily based on The Tempest and continues to influence, I think, all of our work as we go out through up the process every night. Uh, there's a question on Twitter asking how we develop the movement. What? Uh, how we develop the movement sequences. Uh, can, we, can we talk about some about the movement, Pedro? So that I no, if you have your hand up first. Yeah, first. <laughs> Um, well, we had our frantic assembly workshop, well, it was a J-term course, actually, that we did, not this past J-term, but the J-term before, and then we also did, a, I did a Suzuki J-term class uh, this past J-term, um, which are both movement-based uh, uh, theater arts, um, <laughs> and we would do these exercises that frantic assembly uh, does where like chair duets or round by through and uh, they're used to first develop movement and then from there create a story. You, you try not to create a story as you're doing it, um, but then as we would do them and practice them, we'd be like, oh, this would fit really well in this part of the play. And, uh, and we would incorporate that as we went along because uh, it really helped, I think, especially at the beginning when we didn't really have all of our lines assigned yet um, <laughs> to uh, actually <laughs> to start with this movement, especially because 
with my senior thesis, actually, I'm, I'm focusing on that movement base of it because it's so much of this show that we do, and I think it really adds value and importance to the work that we're doing. Hey, do you want to add something? Yeah, uh, you hit a lot of the points that I was going to go for, too. Um, the, the strangest thing was the interplay between, like, movement inspiring something and something inspiring movement. Like, like Haley said, sometimes we would do a do a bit of work and we'd be like, oh, that would work really well here. And then other times, um, the whole part where um, Caliban and Ariel 3 interact in the, towards the middle of the play, um, we had done something different initially and we didn't like it and it was boring. And Neil told Connor and I, go, go figure something out. Come back to me with what, what you got. And it was kind of crazy how like these, these meaning, these movements that had nothing to do with like we had nowhere to pull them from, but they created this story for us and illuminated what happened between Carab Caraban, Caliban, <laughs> and Ariel 3. And it really, like, it puts so much meaning into such a compact place, but it's just crazy to think that, like, I had never explored this kind of stuff before. We, I had worked with Frantic, but, like, that, that there's this alley that we don't use a lot of times in theater, and this is such a useful way to bring about emotion that I think gets pushed under the rug a lot, but it inspired a lot of stuff. Good. Yes, Annette. As an observer, I feel like, and this is going to sound strange, but I feel like um, this, this has had a powerful effect on me, but not yet. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like it's there, but it's pixelized or something. It's going to take time mixing in to settle in and, and feel that understand the impact of the letter to me is, is very powerful, what you've done. But I'm wondering as actors, because it sounds like it's sort of an organic process on steroids. definitely scary at first because like we got the script and we're like uh, at least for me like we read it before we left for summer and I was like wow this is really exciting and then like we came back to it and I was like what <laughs> I had no idea but it was so liberating to like have like nothing going you know like all we had is this script and each other to work on and it, it built bonds like I, I never thought it would and like it, it's just been a Awesome experience. <laughs> yeah. Um, since the script is so open um, and really open to any interpretation that the the producing group can come up with, um, it's become a very personal thing for every single one of us. Um, we've all created this story and these characters and these moments together um, in a way that it will never be done again. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really exciting and was terribly nerve-wracking for all of us when we first opened because we knew that people weren't going to understand everything. We knew that people weren't going to get it you know, as deeply as we get it right now. Um, but we still knew that it was something very powerful that was going to touch people. Um, and that was so exciting and nerve-wracking and just thrilling. Uh, so it's been an incredible process that we've all grown so close through together. I'm speaking of the, of the different, uh, the, 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 just the amount of different um, vision that went into this piece. Uh, and for me, I know at least, and I think probably for a few of us at different points in the rehearsal, uh, occasionally it got to be kind of frustrating. Like, like, and it's, so it was not, it, it was, uh, that's not to say it was entirely smooth sailing, you know? Uh, we did not get here uh, easily, um, and that, that'll happen when you get in any show when you get a, a, a bunch of people who have very different and very powerful visions about the way a script can go. You know about the way a, you know any given scene, any given like three second moment can go, um, and in a space that we've created for the first time in my educational experience. Um, uh, with the space we created with this show of being able to constantly explore almost every option that was presented, gave, it was a, was a lot of there's a lot of freedom and uh, 
gives you more options, which is also terrifying. Because uh, <laughs> then you have to sort of figure out what works best. So it's, it was uh, it's just interesting. It was a very different process. Um, I think one of the craziest moments was when we did our final dress rehearsal. We had uh, Caridad, our playwright here for the first time, uh, which was insane. And also some of our faculty members and some of our fellow peers. And um, it was like a crazy feeling because as an actor, we were put in a very vulnerable place um, because we didn't know how people were going to react. We especially didn't know how Caridad was going to react seeing her work for the first time. And so going out there, like I know we were all nervous that night and because it's just like something that was so personal to us that we developed and we worked together on and it was like almost our own little thing. And I even thought about it like with these people coming in, it was almost like they're watching us through a surveillance camera because it seemed like such a private, personal thing, intimate thing to us. So when all of a sudden there's people watching it and we don't know how they're gonna react, it was just like, really scary, but it was also really wonderful because people had, a lot of people I've talked to have had a similar reaction to yours, mm -hmm. especially after they first see it, where they're like, I didn't understand any, everything, but I liked it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, and it's a lot to take in. We're still like taking in things and learning things because there's so many interpretations that you can take from it. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and we're not done with it. You know, we're gonna travel this show to a festival this summer and you know hopefully they'll have a life even beyond that so so we get to go back and I'll they they don't know how many places and what places I'm like we have to go back to that moment because we we missed something and we just, just telling you now I guess uh, we, we, and there's, there's there's something else we have to find there's some something that got, got lost in that moment that we were maybe we were counting on the technology to communicate that or we we're counting on something else but it needs to be us. Plus, you know, when we tr we're, we're going to Italy with this, and we're not going to bring all of this, so we have to find new ways to tell the story. Often, right? Where we're right now, we're relying on technology. And we're, it needs to go back to the actors. It's their job now to, to tell this story, and that will be, uh, I think, a very exciting challenge. Yes. costume designer for the show. Um, and the zippers, as Neil described last night too when talking to Kim, uh, at the end when we do our bows, we cross each other because we're all like a big zipper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, when I told Kim that, like, did you notice how the cat cur costume, uh, the, whatever, the curtain call, uh, how, how we, the, they come out into pairs and then we, like, I made them into a zipper. And she's like, see, that's what, that must be what it meant. <laughs> All of us, like, you know, pretty much all of us, except for our lovely Miranda, has uh, two people playing the same role. So we cross over lives, and we all have, like, different rules, especially, like, of who, like, what part of Ariel 2 I am versus what part of Prospero is. And, um, yeah, like, we all interweave in certain ways, and it also uh, creates, like, a really edgy look, and it can also create, like, that futuristic kind of look, I think, as well. Um, yeah, it began, I think, with the blue that is so prominent in yeah. this play, translating into denim. And from denim, there are certain avenues to go down to accessorize denim, right? To make denim work <laughs> for all these characters and for all these people um, in a way that's, that's both unifying and cool, and also sort of dis makes distinctions among them. And uh, I think the zipper accessories started as a way, the way one works with denim. Um, yeah. Great. I think something that, I don't know if it can be seen really well um, from in the seats, but a lot of the costumes, almost all of them, have some sort of cursive writing on them. And a lot of them are our, are our personal lines written on our, our sleeves or on our legs. And I think that's so neat, and it came from the inspiration of these words are so important because this text is written as a giant poem. So like, in, in poems, every word counts. And I thought, like, I got chills the first time I came in and I didn't know that there was gonna be words written on my jacket, and I was like, oh my god, and had to put it on just because it, it was spellbinding. And I honestly don't know what it is, but something about it was really 
just kind of brought it all together because not only do we have the unity within the costumes and the characters, we have a physical alignment with our words, with our text, which was so neat. And there are a few moments of nostalgia for handwriting that I think that inspired too, the memory of handwriting. No one, no one writes anything by hand anymore. So we see it there and traces. Yes? I have a question about the script itself, the yes. actual text on the piece of paper that you got when you first looked at it, as you had remarked, when I first read the script, did the playwright give you any stage directions? <laughs> did the playwright break it down into manuscript form or character specific lines? Or was it literally all text, all words on a piece of paper, narrative stream of consciousness? Was there, that it? There are, there are lines that seem to be stage direction occasionally. There are a few. Um, but no, there's never an indication of who's speaking. Right, that, that's never there. Um, it, yes, it mostly reads like poetry, divided into scenes. And in those, there will often be a description of where we are, right? Oh, she divided it into scenes? Yeah, it was labeled scene one through scene 20. So what there's, scene? There are scene break. There's a breakdown of scenes. Uh huh. And uh, though, though even those, there are one or two places where a line continues into the next scene. Oh. Right. So, so, so <laughs> even exactly where and how we understand scene breakdown is is a little bit unconventional even in that. But, um, but no, that's that's it. So, so you can imagine with casting a show. I, I, without knowing how many actors you need, right? You, you don't know yet. Um, without knowing who's going to say what. So to be able to put their names on the list, saying, we are casting these people. I am not assigning a role to you yet. I'm not assigning any lines to you yet. But your 13 people I trust in the room are gonna be able to create something beautiful together and with me, and um, let's get to work. So, uh, so that was different, I'm sure, too, to sign off on, yes, I will be in this show. I don't know who I'm playing or what I'm doing <laughs> yeah. or any of that yet, mm -hmm. what I'm saying, but I, I'm along for the ride. So that I appreciated the trust that they all put in me and in the script and the process. How did you divide it up then? Yeah. How did you do right. that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, sometimes it just happened, and it, 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 it happened organically. You, what, what mostly happened is we started to figure out that, okay, this, the way this play is working with memory, often there is something happening in the force, there's gonna be something happening in the force stage that is in the live, right? The present, the real, and there is a memory. So it makes sense that we would cast Ariel One and Memory Ariel One, or Mind Ariel One, like some other Ariel One. So we'll pick two actors and we'll put them in that role and we'll see how we use them. We'll see how that plays out. And, and the script does call for Boy Caliban and Young Man Caliban okay. as All two right. separate. So there was already clearly two Calibans. <laughs> but then there's second Ariel, which we have two of, and third Ariel, who we have two of, and Prospero, whom we have two of, and we have only one Miranda. <laughs> special. And we have two sicker actors, right? So she's here in the hospital having memories she's making up because she has no memory. So we need someone to be the memory that sicker acts has of yellow dressed sunflowers dancing at Roseland, right? So we cast two actors as sicker acts. So 13 ended up being a, the right number. I didn't know that when we picked these 13 people. Uh, but I think it ended up being just the right number. Little luck there. Yeah, Austin. We experimented a lot uh, with a couple of readings earlier in the year, around November, the playwright came. Um, and we read through things, and we would try something out, for instance, have this person read um, uh, lines that seem to be said by the character, and this person read any directions or actions mm -hmm. that pertain to whatever that character is doing. So we would try new things, uh, and if they didn't work, we would try something else. Yeah? Okay. To tie it into another question, uh, it also created a lot of fear, I think, for a lot of us, to know that when we were given a script like this, uh, like David said, uh, you know, what? <laughs> when we first read it, as well as, uh, like Krishna was saying earlier, it gives a lot of room for a lot of visions. 
right? You can totally interpret it whatever way you want. And as soon as you interpret a script a specific way, you're very passionately, artistically connected to the script in that specific vision, uh, which made collaboration a very interesting and very constantly passionate process uh, on the stage between us, between the tech. Uh, and it also, you know, created a lot of fear and, and, and made it a scary process. And, you know, at times uh, we, were, we were worried, sincerely worried. And I've never taken a risk that's paid off so monumentally as this one. I w yeah, like going off of that, we had the script all summer and it was like, well, we can't work on it because we don't know, like, first of all, who we are or what our lines are. So I just like, I'm just going to read it again. Um, but like, and there was definitely like, what is going to happen? And we just like figured it out one day at a time and one chunk at a time. And like, I think it built a lot of trust and we bonded through that because it was just so like, we just have to trust each other and figure this out. And we did. And like, we are figuring things out like right to the end. But Today. it happened. <laughs> <laughs> we, we completely yeah. reblocked a scene or two in Tech Week, and, and they've been getting new cues, you know, up to and including today. So, uh, so yeah, the, the tech team, is, which has been extraordinary and has worked so hard to realize that I can come up with any crazy thing and say, here we need a, face, <laughs> we need a picture, a video of Prospero waving on Facebook, and can you make that tonight? You know, so that, because it, it, we obviously need it. And, and you know. <laughs> what is the sound of blue? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. <laughs> First question. Well, there, were, there were moments where we would look at four lines and spend an hour trying to figure out how we were going to yeah. <laughs> explore these four lines. On a, we would sit on a circle, laying down, frustrated, for an hour and figure out what does and store sours means. <laughs> and, um, but I think because of that, because of the time that we invested into making sure that we wanted to get what we were saying across, I think those po like, moments are really poignant and clear. Um, and so at, least to us. Was, <laughs> at least to us, <laughs> anyway. Um, we we're so invested in making sure that these words hit home and were, were powerful that we would spend literally hours on just one chunk of text. And, and that fear wasn't just the cast. I'm not going to pretend I was the all-knowing comedy yeah. <laughs> director. I mean, and there were a couple of times I know I, I came in and Russell said, it's going to look today like I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> but we're going to work on scene 12 today, and I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> right? um, but it was with always, you know, in, in my defense, uh, with the thought all along that these these scenes are going to be born out of the collective genius here, right? Of, out of the minds and vision of the ensemble. And, you know, it says actually like on the, the title page or the second page of the script, there's like that artistic decision should be made with everyone in the room. Oh. And, I, and, I, and I think we tried our best to honor that, that, that designers should be in the room and, and with the director and with the cast while we're working through a scene to try to figure out what are, how are we going to tell this part of the story? And, uh, and I took that to mean these people all really need to be invested in the creation of, of the work that we do. All right. Yeah. Okay. So with the openness of the script and different variations of the characters, how did you, the actors, define your character so you could get into it's a good question. The question was, so with the openness of the script and the characters, how did you actors define your characters? Yeah. Um, so our actor training here is usually based on Stanislavski, um, Declan Donnellan. It's always, what are you going to do to the other person in the scene? How are, what are your objectives? What are your goals? And um, we kind of have to have a different process <laughs> of that uh, because these characters are really characters per se, Caridad refers to them as figures. Mm -hmm. And so when we said, what is my character's objective? How are we gonna achieve this? We are like, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> um, and so we sat down with Neil and we are like, I don't know what to do. Um, and he said, basically the top was, you, don't, you can't think of it like that. You kind of have to embody the essence and the spirit of 
what this message is about and try to channel it in that way. And I think the character comes to you in a different kind of process. So I think we had to rethink our training, basically, and, and, and we eventually did come back to it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the process and the journey of trying to figure out who we were was a different process than what we usually take. Scoring scripts, mm -hmm. writing down objectives is very, very different from what we learn in our training. Uh, I think for me, there was a lot of like going to the text and with, with a poem, poems are inspired by, uh, by a strong emotion a lot of times. So it was about kind of finding the emotion in those words and how to make it outward because you can experience it sometimes, but it, it doesn't translate outward. So that was a lot of like finding either through a movement or a connection with somebody. And it was less focused on like what Marie said, like objective, but the interplay between people and then having a double too was really interesting because I was trying to like think, how do I sit like a boy? I sit like a girl, how do I sit like a boy? Like. <laughs> put your chest in and so I'd look at, I'd watch David sit and I would like kind of kind of try to sit like him and you, you try to pick up the, the nuances of the other person but then the characters themselves, the, the doubles become nuanced in here's me trying to imitate you a little bit and you trying to imitate me a little bit maybe and then the differences between you that create this zipper, like they, they come together and it was so interesting like such a cool challenge and something so interesting to be playing the same person, but being able to find your, your nuances within, like adding a little bit of salt and pepper to, you know, whatever. So that was really cool. We are gonna wrap up in just a minute. I know this is, this is running longer. Hilarita. Um, Just as a quick, um, the script is also incredibly relatable. Um, there are just so many lines that I just like wanna write over and over and over again. Um, and I know all of us feel the same way. We're gonna be quoting this for a very long time. Um, I know for me personally, I will never stop referencing this show. Um, it was just incredibly relatable, it's beautifully written, um, and it's really easy to get in character, I think, for this, even though it is kind of vague. Um, it's just so beautiful and so meaningful that, like, how can you not feel connected to it? Yeah, um, I think a lot of it for me came from just figuring out what Ariel 1's through line was. Um, what is happening to her throughout the course of this play. And she really is um, going through a grieving process. She's lost Prospero. And once that really like settled in my brain, I was able to see this is where she's at in this scene. And at this point, she's gotten to here. And um, just following that line really helped. And then Maura and I also talked several times about you know, who was she? Was she a journalist? You know, and how long were she and Prospero together? It was something that a lot of us talked about. Um, so we came up with a lot of it ourselves, and a lot of it came from really digging into the text um, and working together to figure it out. Yeah, I think our coming to terms and starting to understand the script was very interactive and experiential, right? There's a lot of the physical work was our way in, right? But once discoveries had been made and, and certain of them, no, there is a story of Caliban that we're telling. There is a story of Ariel that we're telling. There, there, there's, there's more and of Ariel too. There's a story we're telling. And then once you dis, you've discovered it and you've started to develop it, then some of those more conventional tools, so understanding character and, uh, and objective and, and those things, uh, those start to come back into play. I think we need to wrap up. Is there one more out there that we, that we want to feel? I'd like to say something. Sure. Um, I think that theatrically, an ensemble show like this is the hardest thing you can possibly create. And I commend you as a director to allow these people to flourish as an ensemble. I think you did a great job, especially if the text is as you say. I think, and, and when you get into those movement things, when you start doing that kind of, whatever you call it, dance, that's when you <laughs> as an ensemble really come alive. And you should let it sail more. Do you know what I'm talking about when you start yeah. Yeah. And by that, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and you gotta let it fly more. But you did a great job, really. I commend you, it's so difficult. You did a great job.
watching this performance, tonight's performance, live streaming on HowlRound.com. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and it is my understanding that it's going to be archived there as well. So if you, like, I think I need to see this again. I, I, I'd like, I'd like to, I, I know somebody who would maybe be interested in seeing this. I'd like to share it with. Uh, it, it will be there. Go to HowlRound, look through their archive, and, uh, and at some point it'll show up there. So thank you all. Thank you very much for seeing Thank you. Thank you.